everyone. And welcome to Radcliffe Day 2015. And we do have a spectacular day, so um, I'm so happy that you're here. I'm Liz Cohen, I'm Dean of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. <laughs> I know that was for the Institute. Today we celebrate Radcliffe past, present, and future. And we honor Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who will receive the Radcliffe Medal this afternoon. It is a tradition to begin Radcliffe Day with a panel discussion that connects directly with the life's work of our honoree. The panel is not dedicated purely to our medalist's success, though that would be richly deserved and easy to do. Instead, we explore the complexities and the challenges faced by anyone working to change the world. The Radcliffe Medal celebrates those who do the hard work and fight the good fight. They win many, but not all. Last year, our Radcliffe medalist was Harvard President Drew Gilpin Faust, who is here with us today. <laughs> the morning panel that Radcliffe Day was titled From Civil War to Civil Rights, The Unending Battle to Vote and it focused on the history of civil rights and access to voting in honor of Drew's commitment to social justice. Our expert panelists discussed more than a century of controversial voter ID laws, redistricting plans, and court decisions alongside successful efforts to enfranchise more American citizens. The year before that, we honored Jane Alexander, actor, arts advocate, and former director of the NEA. On that panel, titled From Artist to Audience, a poet, a painter, a composer, a curator, and a theater director spoke. They shared the challenges faced by both emerging and established artists to produce new and imaginative work amidst all the funding obstacles. And they reminded us of the enduring power of creativity. Chief Justice Margaret Marshall, today's moderator, was awarded the Radcliffe Medal the prior year. And that morning panel explored the dynamic between the law and social change. Titled, From Front Lines to High Courts, its topics range from labor reform and educational access to marriage equality and reproductive rights. In the course of discussing, discussing stigmas, setbacks, and successes, the panelists considered this quotation from Martin Luther King, Jr. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. But how do we measure that arc? One way is by understanding the points that give it shape and direction. For this morning's discussion, we are looking at decisions and dissents in the first decade of the Roberts Court that mark the path of that arc as it moves through history. John G. Roberts was nominated to the position of Chief Justice of, by then President George W. Bush in 2005. At the time of his confirmation, Chief Justice Roberts said, and I quote, judges are like umpires. Umpires don't make the rules, they apply them. And he went on to say, I will remember that it's my job to call balls and strikes and not to pitch or bat. In the 10 years since, the Roberts Court has made a lot of calls. The court has called safe and then called out on doctor-assisted suicide, voting rights, campaign finance regulations, and reproductive health, to name only a few. This morning, our panelists will help us decipher these calls. And I cannot think of a better umpire than Chief Justice Margaret Hillary Marshall. <laughs> oh. 
Margie has held many impressive titles, including partner at Sapler and Bach, partner at Choate Hall and Stewart, president of the Boston Bar Association, general counsel of Harvard University, and of course, chief justice of the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts. We like to think that Radcliffe Medalist is also one of her prize titles, and we are honored that she will be giving her papers to our Schlesinger Library. As an aside, let me proudly mention that the Schlesinger Library has a new Fortsheimer faculty director, and she is here with us today. Historian and author Jane Kamensky will be joining the Radcliffe Institute and the History Department at Harvard in the fall. The Schlesinger Library's Marshall Papers will be a remarkable resource for all who are interested in Chief Justice Marshall's values and views. During her 14-year tenure as Chief Justice, she authored more than 300 opinions. The best known is likely Goodridge v. Department of Public Health, which in 2003 made Massachusetts the first state to legalize marriage for same-sex couples. <laughs> This is a decision that reverberates more than a decade later, as you can see, including very recently in the chambers of the Roberts Court, as well as globally with last week's vote in Ireland. <laughs> Margie retired from her position as Chief Justice in 2011, but her work is far from done. She teaches at Harvard Law School, she serves as senior counsel at Choate Hall and Stewart, and she continues to shape our appreciation for and understanding of the judiciary. So it is with great pleasure and gratitude that I ask you to join me in welcoming this morning's moderator, Margaret Marshall. And of course, welcome our guest of honor, our honoree. everyone and for those of you at the back you may not have understood that um, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg just arrived and I frankly don't think that was a sufficiently warm welcome so <laughs> could you please welcome again Justice <laughs> Justice Ginsburg, it is so wonderful to have you here. And we are going to proceed this morning by talking about the past 10 years of your court um, and discuss some of the decisions that have come down in that time. So one of the questions I think always is, does a Chief Justice make any difference? And I don't really know about that, but I do know we talk about... <laughs> We do talk about the Warren Court and the Burger Court and the Rehnquist Court, and we thought that after 10 years of Chief Justice Roberts, we could talk a little bit about the Roberts Court. This morning, we have four extraordinary people who really know a lot about what goes on in the United States Supreme Court. Three of them, because they worked for justices on the United States Supreme Court, three different justices, and one of them, because for 30 years, 
She followed every movement, every syllable, every <laughs> sentence of the lowest court. And I have to say, Linda Greenhouse, you know more inside stuff than anybody I know. <laughs> but she will tell you that she never got it from any of the law clerks. <laughs> and I think that's probably correct. And what we decided to do was have a very simple format. Uh, we've had some wonderful discussions leading up to this, and each of three, the, um, John Manning and Linda Greenhouse and Ball and Sudia Lucas are going to present three cases, and then the four of them are going to discuss uh, during and after. And then um, Professor Klarman, who clerked for uh, Justice Ginsburg, is going to make a few remarks before we adjourn to lunch. So, Professor Manning. Thank you very much, Chief Justice Marshall. Uh, I want to thank Dean Cohen and the Radcliffe Institute for putting on this wonderful event and uh, to thank Justice Ginsburg for being here and to congratulate her on uh, the latest in a, a long series of well-deserved honors. Um, so I'm uh, here to talk about the Supreme Court's famous decision in National Federation of Independent Business versus Sibelius. Uh, the case got a lot of headlines for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, at the most basic level, it upheld the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act, or as the press likes to call it, uh, Obamacare. Uh, that was a big deal in and of itself. Uh, the court said that Congress has the constitutional authority to order you or me to buy health insurance or to pay a fee or fine if we don't. Now, Congress had never quite done anything like that before, and so the decision itself was a big deal. Second, the court divided in a kind of goofy, interesting, and revealing way. Um, you know, one that made people kind of scratch their heads and say, what's going on? Uh, Chief Justice Roberts was at the center of all of this. Um, in one part of, the opi of his opinion, uh, the court uh, said that the, the so-called individual mandate could be justified under Congress's power uh, to tax, under the constitutional taxing power, even though Congress had not called the thing a tax. Uh, there, Chief Justice Roberts was joined by the court's four Democratic appointees. Now, in another part of the Chief Justice's opinion, he wrote that the individual mandate could not be justified as an exercise of Congress's power to, quote, regulate commerce among the several states. In other words, Obamacare passed muster under the taxing clause, but flunked the commerce clause. Though no other justice joined the chief's opinion on the Commerce Clause, the court's four other Republican appointees wrote a joint dissent that essentially said the same thing as the chief justice did. Now, this is an odd turn of events. If, usually, if the court finds that Congress has the power to do something under one clause of the Constitution, it doesn't bother to opine on whether it has the power also to do the same thing uh, under another clause of the Constitution. Uh, in the trade, we call, uh, we call uh, the, the, this sort of abstract essay dictum, uh, and the court doesn't uh, usually or isn't supposed to uh, write on abstract questions that don't affect the outcome of the decision. But today, I'm actually going to talk about the dicta in the Chief Justice's opinion uh, about the, the Commerce Clause, because I think that part of the Chief's opinion actually crystallizes uh, the Roberts Court's approach to federalism cases uh, more generally. And so here's, here's my take on, on the court's uh, approach in those cases. I think this court, like its predecessor, the Rehnquist Court, feels very comfortable second-guessing Congress's legislative judgments about how to carry its powers into effect based on the court's own abstract assessments of the very broad constitutional principle of federalism or reserved state powers. Now, it's important to acknowledge up front that the Chief Justice and the Joint Dissent at least purported to rest on the text of the Commerce Clause, as you might think, right? They wanted to point to some part of the Constitution that was at issue. And they argued that because the individual mandate told people sitting at home, <laughs> minding their own business, to go out and buy something, that there was simply no commerce here for Congress to regulate, or in other words, what they said was that the statute, in the statute, Congress created rather than regulated uh, commerce and that that was not permissible. Now look, this is an ingenious argument, ingenious, but, but it doesn't hold water. 
Um, <laughs> and, and here's why. Um, <coughs> the Obamacare statute is all about interstate commerce. Even if I'm sitting at home minding my own business, not buying anything, much less insurance, there is a massive interstate health insurance market operating all around me. And the individual mandate unquestionably and quite directly regulates that interstate market. And here's how. A different and uncontested section of the ACA says that you and I have the right to go out and buy insurance even if we have pre-existing conditions. So if I'm a healthy young person, why on earth would I buy insurance until I needed it? That is to say, until I actually got sick. This incentive threatened to drain the healthiest people out of the risk pool in the interstate health insurance market. And the individual mandate regulates the interstate commerce, interstate commerce and the interstate health insurance market by pushing those potential free riders back into the risk pool, plain and simple. So if it's not the text of the Commerce Clause that's really doing the work here, what is it? Certainly, no clause of the Constitution tells Congress <coughs> that it can't mandate individual behavior. Nor is there any unstated constitutional tradition or practice or line of precedent that prohibits Congress from ordering people to buy things if doing so would help Congress regulate interstate commerce. So what explains the Chief Justice's and the Joint, dis joint Dissent's position? A couple of things. First, as I mentioned, Congress had never done anything quite like this before. For the justices who were skeptical of the commerce power justification for the statute, the absence of, uh, a, a, of a pre existing practice of, uh, like the individual mandate, was, quote, the most telling indication of a constitutional issue or a constitutional infirmity. <coughs> Second, <coughs> the statute reflected a large expansion of federal power. In the Chief Justice's words, quote, allowing Congress to justify federal regulation by pointing to the effect of inaction on commerce would bring countless decisions an individual could potentially make within the scope of federal regulation and empower Congress to make those decisions for him. To put it colloquially, if Congress can make us buy insurance, it can also make us eat our spinach. <laughs> uh, and well, actually what the court said was broccoli, but, but, but you, get, you get the idea. Uh, and, and, and that, the Chief Justice wrote, quote, is not the country our, the framers of our Constitution envisioned. Well, look, at one level, the Chief Justice is quite right about that. This is not the country the framers envisioned. But that's not really the legally relevant point, <laughs> even for originalists. The framers obviously didn't anticipate a country of 320 million people, a global economy, Uber cars, Apple watches, <laughs> or even an interstate health insurance market. What they did anticipate was this, that they couldn't foresee the future. And they explicitly provided for that reality in the design of the Constitution. And here's what they did. They did so by giving Congress primary and broad authority to adapt federal power to unforeseeable change. Now, as, as that, that other Chief Justice Marshall uh, said, <laughs> in a famous opinion called McCulloch versus Maryland, uh, which upheld Congress's power to create a central bank, the framers knew that they could not devise a complex code of rules for a constitution, quote, intended to endure for the ages. They did set out some rules, right? The president has to be 35. Uh, legislation has to pass two houses. Each state gets two senators and, and so forth. Uh, and, and those rules Congress can't mess with. Uh, no matter how the world changes. But for most aspects of our government, 
the framers said very little. They mostly left the details blank, and they adopted something called the Necessary and Proper Clause that gives Congress primary authority to fill in those blanks. In Chief Justice Marshall's words, quote, to avail itself of experience, to exercise its reason, and to accommodate legislation to new circumstances. It was to be the American people speaking through Congress and not the justices who were to figure out how, what government measures were appropriate as, as America passes into new ages and new worlds. Something like the individual mandate or whatever the next innovation might be offends some particular constitutional text or long-standing practice. If Congress were to pass a law authorizing mature 34-year-olds to become president, then the court can and must say no. But if the court has little more to go on than its own sense that this or that arrangement is too novel, that it gives Congress too much power, or that it is something that the framers would not have countenanced in the world that they knew, then the court is making a judgment call that the Constitution explicitly reserves to Congress. In cases like Sibelius, it is precisely this allocation of decision-making power that should be foremost in the court's deliberations. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, and I have to <coughs> say, I did see you leeching for the spinach quiche this morning. But that was, uh, um, as you know, what we're gonna do is go backwards and forwards between questions from among ourselves and also questions from you. There are note cards. If you have any, please pass them along and somebody will come and pick them. Just raise your hand. And the people at the back, if you can't hear, please let, wave like crazy and we'll try and fix that. So I have just one question, and any one of the three of you can answer it. One of the points that um, John made was that this court, the Roberts Court, has been second-guessing Congress's powers to a remarkable extent. Is this new? I mean, for those of us who think about the pre-New Deal, is this a different way that the court is viewing its relationship with another branch? Michael? If you don't want to talk, <laughs> Lauren. It's, it's new, but it's not brand new. So the, the Supreme Court rarely challenged congressional legislation in the 19th century. They struck down a statute in Marbury versus Madison, the first case to declare the power of judicial review. They didn't strike down another federal statute until Dred Scott, the infamous case dealing with Congress trying to keep slavery out of the Missouri Compromise territory, uh, the territory acquired in the Louisiana Purchase. But Congress, the court rarely struck down congressional legislation until the 20th century. It's something that's happened fairly regularly in the last 40 years, so I don't think it's distinctive to the Roberts Court. Great. Other comments? So my, can you hear me? What's always intrigued me about the Chief Justice's role in Sibelius is uh, what motivated him to both gratuitously expressed his views on the Commerce Clause, and Justice Ginsburg wrote a fabulous dissenting opinion in that case, pointing out that, as, as you indicated, John, that the entire Commerce Clause uh, disposition was, was gratuitous. So what motivated him both to do that and then to pull back and find um, a deus ex machina in the form of the tax power to save the statute and maybe save the court? I don't know, but what do you think? I find it a puzzle. <laughs> <laughs> also known as taking the Fifth Amendment. <laughs> There's one person in this tent who knows the answer and she's not telling <laughs> <laughs> On that note, <laughs> Ms. Greenhouse, would you like to proceed uh, with your case, parents involved? Okay, so I, I have uh, less of a formal academic presentation than, than John did. Uh, but what I'm gonna say is not disconnected from his presentation, which is in parents involved, and I'm not gonna go through the details of the case, so I urge you to read my carefully written little summary in this blue booklet. Um, example of judicial activism in another frame, 
This wasn't the court against Congress. This was the court against local control of the public schools. And you know, the Roberts Court has had maybe 700 decisions on the merits in the 10 years. And, and the way this panel was organized is that Chief Justice Marshall invited each of us to select one case to talk about. So why did I choose parents involved? I chose it because I think it's really emblematic of a very disturbing aspect of the Roberts Court, which is, I hate to use the cliched word, activism. But this was a very activist, uh, not only opinion, but assertion of jurisdiction uh, by the court to even decide this case. So, uh, you know, the, the basic uh, metric that the court applies in deciding whether it should exercise its almost complete discretion on what to decide is whether there's a case that presents a conflict among the lower courts on an important matter of federal law. There actually was no conflict on the question of whether a school board seeking to preserve integration, not to preserve segregation, to preserve the hard-won gains of integration achieved through uh, struggle and uh, federal court supervision, and in these cases, busing orders and so on, they finally get a measure of integration, and they want to keep it. And there are residential housing patterns that make it very difficult to keep it. There are social trends that make it very difficult to keep it. So in this case, both the city, the school board of Louisville, Kentucky, of course, once a de jure segregated city, uh, and the school board of Seattle, Washington, of course, never de jure segregated, but uh, highly racially isolated schools because of housing patterns and had been under court orders for many years, decided that in, a, in modest ways in terms of student deciding that they wanted to transfer from one school to another or to choose one high school versus another high school, uh, the school board was entitled to take race into account to preserve or to, to prevent a return to racially isolated schools and, and classrooms. And this issue has come up around the country and the lower courts had all agreed uh, that <coughs> this was something uh, that school boards could choose to do uh, for this benign purpose. And in fact, um, just before Justice O'Connor left the court in late 2005, such a case came up to the court uh, from this region, from the First Circuit, and the court decided not to hear it uh, because it didn't meet the usual test of conflict in the circuits. As soon as O'Connor left the court, that is to say in early 2006, uh, these two cases, a challenge to the plan in Louisville and a challenge to the plan in Seattle, made their way onto the court's docket, and the court decided, even though it didn't meet the usual uh, characteristics for what's called a cert-worthy case, the court decided to take it. So, so what did they decide? Uh, <coughs> in an opinion for four justices by Chief Justice Roberts, the court said, basically, this is just Brown against Board of Education from the other side. This is government counting by race, and there's no, we can't do that. The, uh, cities of Louisville and Seattle had no compelling interest, and compelling interest is the test for uh, under the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Guarantee for when the government can justify uh, classifying people by race. There's no compelling interest in preserving integration. He wrote for only four because Justice Kennedy, who agreed with the outcome and in fact has never voted to uphold any racial categorization on the part of the Supreme Court said, actually, it's a little more complicated than that. You may remember the, the line with which uh, Chief Justice Roberts ended his opinion. He said, the way to get beyond racial discriminating on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. Now, that's a very deep and profound uh, <laughs> reflection. And uh, Justice Kennedy said, it's a little more complicated than that. He said, of course the cities of Louisville and Seattle have a compelling interest in preserving integration. Obviously they do. Uh, his, the problem that Justice Kennedy found with these plans is he said they weren't sufficiently narrowly tailored, and narrow, narrow tailoring is the other main aspect of a 14th Amendment analysis. They weren't sufficiently narrow, narrowly tailored to meet the equal protection demands of the 14th Amendment. By that he meant there were other things that the school districts might have done other than uh, categorizing students on the basis of race, uh, question of where school 
district lines were drawn or schools with special programs that could attract people and so on and so on. Whether that's at all uh, realistic on the ground, I, I, I'm not in a position to say, but as a doctrinal matter, it was very interesting. Uh, so the other thing that interests me about the case, other than the sheer activism of taking it, is that the Chief Justice was so determined to say what he wanted to say, to use the case for the purpose for which he wanted to use it, and to say that no compelling interest, and this is just the backwards round against the Board of Education, that he wasn't willing to meet Justice Kennedy where Justice Kennedy was. All he would have had to say was, we don't have to decide, if, he, if, if this is what he wanted to say, we don't have to decide whether there's a compelling interest because all we have to find is that this remedy is not narrowly tailored to serve that interest. And that would have let him speak for a majority. Uh, it would have not decided the, the most profound issue in the case. And so this was early in the Roberts Court. It was a 2007 uh, decision. And I think it was um, a, a rather disturbing early indication of how he saw his role in both carrying out what I call a Roberts project on, on race, on, on getting the government out of the business of counting by race for any reason. And this, we're not, <coughs> Shelby County, the Voting Rights Act case, is not one of our cases, but that was a major one, a disabled application of the heart of the Voting Rights Act, same, same project. Uh, but also his uh, unwillingness to bend a little bit uh, to meet Justice Kennedy where Justice Kennedy was. Now, uh, I'll conclude by saying that in the intervening years, because here we are in 2015, this was all the way back in 2007, I'm not sure that we would see the same behavior from John Roberts today. I think he's, this sounds condescending, and I don't mean it to sound condescending, I respect the man. Uh, he's matured in his role as <laughs> Chief Justice, uh, and I think <coughs> sees the virtue of um, not necessarily having to win every case that he can win, or in this case he didn't win on the compelling interest point, uh, but rather um, try to work a bit of a compromise. I think we've seen that in, in recent years in very fascinating ways, including uh, just last term the case that struck down the, the bubble zone around the abortion clinics in Massachusetts law where he wrote a quite tempered opinion that allowed uh, Justice Ginsburg and others to, to join his opinion. I don't, think that I don't think we would have seen that from the earlier Chief Justice Roberts. Um, so it, that's why I chose Parents Involved. That's why it's a case worth um, thinking about and um, keeping in mind as the Roberts Court goes forward. Thank you, Linda. So, Linda, just to reassure you, I hope that all Chief Justices mature as they go along. <laughs> and I want to tell you some of my early opinions. Oh. <laughs> but I'm not going to tell you which ones. Uh, one of the things the United States Supreme Court does is it tells other federal courts, I hate to use the term lower federal courts, but we often call them lower federal courts, what to do. Has there been have there been cases where you can see the federal courts becoming more active based on um, parents involved? No, I mean, I, I've, I've wondered uh, what's been happening after... I mean, you mentioned the voting case, but just sort of what's happening in educational systems? Yeah, um, no, I don't have a good answer for that. I haven't seen other parents involved type cases making their way through the system, my impression is that things are sort of getting worked out at the local level without necessarily going to court. But what, of course, we haven't seen the final word on at all is the general question of affirmative action. In, in higher education, there's a case pending uh, on the court's docket right now, which we'll hear about any day, whether the court's going to get back into Fisher against the University of Texas, the University of Texas affirmative action case. Uh, which they couldn't quite decide uh, two years ago, sent back to the lower court. The lower court said, um, uh, yeah, we just kind of stand by what we said before. And so, um, so that's a big open question, whether the court's going to get back into that. Sure. You know, you talked, <clears throat> you selected this court as a way of indicating that, the, that at least the chief justice, if not the court, will sort of reach out 
bend some of the jurisdictional rules, perhaps, or not look at you know the way they usually take cases as an example of an activist case. And then you mentioned the Chief Justice's project on race. Are there other cases, Lauren or Mike, that you think show one way or the other what his view on race as race is? Well, just um, not to hijack your question, but I think to, to respond also to that question about the impact, and there's the presidential impact, but I think there's also the question of symbolic impact. I mean, Brown versus Board of Education was arguably the most you know, important case maybe that the Supreme Court has decided from a symbolic perspective, and so when parents involved just take a case that important and just recharacterize and redeploy it in a way that's very different from I think many you know, would see the intention of Brown um, is really quite something. And I think the interplay between the other opinions in that case is really startling as well. And you have Justice Thomas comparing what the school districts in Louisville and Seattle are doing to what the segregationists did in 1954. I think to make that comparison is so sort of divorced from intention and from historical context that it's really hard to, to get one's mind around. Um, and I think that the, the line that Linda mentioned, the way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. I thought Justice Sotomayor had such an eloquent sort of response seven years later in her dissent in Schuette, in the affirmative action case um, from Michigan, when she said that the way to stop discriminating on the basis of race is to speak openly and candidly about race and to apply the Constitution with eyes open to the unfortunate effects of centuries of racial discrimination. So I think parents involved... <laughs> I think it's had a very you know, important symbolic importance. If not, you know, if it hasn't been cited, I think it still had an indirect you know, influence both on other courts but also on the public and the way we think about race more broadly. Sure. Michael? Yeah, um, so I, I agree with that. I just wanted to add something. Linda's point is that it's procedurally activist for the court to resolve this question when there was no pressing need. It's also important to understand it's substantively activist. So the conservative justices who are the ones who would insist that the Constitution ought to be colorblind are the ones who would criticize, <clears throat> excuse me, criticize the court if it struck down, <clears throat> excuse me, criticize the court if it struck down an abortion restriction or perhaps if the court rules in favor of gay marriage. They would accuse the court of being activists for reading the Constitution in a way that wasn't intended by the people who wrote it. But it turns out that the 14th Amendment was not clearly intended to embrace colorblindness. In fact, there is no good historical argument that that's what the people who wrote the 14th Amendment intended. And there's nothing in the text of the 14th Amendment that talks about race somehow being off limits to government classification. The people who wrote it, ironically, were too racist to actually support a, a ban on race classifications. <laughs> they said repeatedly when they were adopting the amendment, this doesn't in mandate that you enfranchise blacks, this doesn't mandate that you end school segregation. So from the perspective of the conservative justices, if the text of the Constitution doesn't rule out a particular policy, and the original understanding of that text doesn't clearly rule out a particular policy, then you're supposed to defer to democracy and defer to local government. And as Linda was saying, this is as local as it gets. This is a local school board adopting an integrationist policy. So this is activism, not just procedurally, this is substantive activism from the right. Great. Okay. <laughs> Linda, Linda, last word, or you've had your say. It's been, okay, Lauren. So again, um, Linda said we, we asked each of them to select one opinion of the 10 years that indicated something important. Lauren. So, um, thank you, and thank you again to Dean Cohen and the Radcliffe Institute for having me here today. The case that I chose to discuss for my portion of the discussion is Ashcroft versus Iqbal. <coughs> To many of you, this case might seem unfamiliar. It isn't one that received a lot of attention from the media, or at least not as much as some of the other cases, but it is really important in part because it represents an emerging theme of the Roberts Court, which is defining the role of the courts in much narrower terms and restricting plaintiffs' access to the courts and access to justice, particularly for individual and pro se plaintiffs. The cases that my co-panelists have discussed today highlight for good reason some of the larger social and political issues that the court has confronted, confronted over the last decade <laughs> A lot of the cases the court hears, however, involve procedural and jurisdictional questions that aren't particularly exciting and don't attract a lot of attention outside legal circles, but they go to the deeply important question of whether a court can even entertain a claim and who, had, who can assert such a claim. 
these questions are precursors. We have to answer those questions before we get to cases like Sibelius or parents involved. In addressing these questions, although there have been some anomalies, the Roberts Court has often acted to restrict access to the courts. Just to provide a few examples of the areas in which the Roberts Court has already had an impact, first, the Roberts Court has broadly interpreted arbitration agreements to prevent injured individuals from going to court, instead channeling them into arbitration and restricting their ability to vindicate their rights in that context. The court has prevented habeas petitioners from presenting new evidence in federal court, even if evidence regarding actual innocence or prosecutorial misconduct has emerged. Instead, they're limited to the record as it existed in state court. The court has limited the instances in which individuals can sue states in federal court to challenge unconstitutional state action. And there are, there are other examples, and then the last that I'll mention and where I'll focus today is that the court has raised the bar for what a plaintiff has to allege at the outset of litigation in, wor in order to avoid being thrown out of court altogether. So Iqbal, as the description in your program says, arose in the wake of 9-11. Javed Iqbal was challenging his treatment by the United States government while he was detained. The court never reached the question of whether his treatment was actually unconstitutional. Instead, the precursor question and the only question the court did answer was whether he had alleged sufficient facts in his complaint to survive a motion to dismiss. So for those who aren't lawyers, when a plaintiff wishes to initiate a lawsuit in federal court, initially she files a complaint and then you would progress to discovery where the two sides exchange information and then, at least in theory, or potentially to trial. So this, these cases, Twombly and Iqbal, are about the transition from that first to that second step. Has the plaintiff done enough or presented enough in her complaint to justify moving on to discovery? So the federal rules of civil procedure state that a complaint must provide a short and plain statement of the claim showing that the pleader is entitled to relief. For decades, this was understood to be a fairly lenient standard, just putting the other side on notice of the claim. So it was often referred to as notice pleading, just sort of giving them a heads up as to what would be involved in the litigation. Two years before Iqbal, in a case Bell Atlantic Corporation versus Twombly, the court raised that standard in the antitrust context, but it wasn't clear whether it would apply beyond that context. In Twombly, the court said that a judge should determine at the outset of a case whether a complaint states a plausible claim for relief. So interjecting some judgment there, not just putting the other side on notice, but allowing the judge to sort of exercise discretion as to whether this is really plausible. Iqbal took a further step, making clear that that standard would apply to all civil cases in federal court. What is the difference? Well, before, a plaintiff's allegations were presumed to be true, and a complaint would be dismissed only if there were no set of facts that would entitle the plaintiff to relief. But in Iqbal, the standard provides lower courts with much greater judicial discretion, and it's really a very subjective determination. The court suggested that a reviewing court should draw on their judicial experience and common sense when making such a determination, and I'll touch on that later <coughs> in the way in which it's allowed bias to sort of filter into making these determinations about whether a complaint um, or whether a claim in a complaint is plausible. So this all might seem very technical. We're talking about pleading standards and complaints, so why does it matter? Well, Iqbal was cited more than 500 times in the two months following the decision, and just eight months after the decision had been cited in 8,000 lower court cases. At only two years old, Twombly was one of the five most frequently cited Supreme Court cases in lower federal courts in all of American history. So they really grasped on this as important and obviously something that they should be following in assessing complaints before them. One prominent Supreme Court litigator said that Iqbal was the most significant Supreme Court decision in a decade for day-to-day -day litigation in the federal courts. So there are a number of studies assessing the impact that it's had in terms of claims being dismissed. Just to give you a few numbers, um, the overall rate of dismissal went from 61% pre-Twombly to 72% Iqbal after Iqbal. And the impact has been felt more strongly or more deeply in cases involving civil rights discrimination, employment discrimination in prison, and in cases involving pro se plaintiffs or you know, plaintiffs who are serving as their own lawyer. So in civil rights cases that are pro se, the dismissal rate went from 85% to 92%. In prison cases, from 67% to 85%. And employment discrimination cases where the plaintiff was represented by counsel from 47% to 65%. One of the reasons for this uptick in dismissals is that often to prove her claim, a plaintiff needs information of the, from the other side. So for example, in discrimination cases where you have to prove a discriminatory intent, it's very hard to do that, particularly for poor or pro se litigants who aren't resourced and who don't have access to know what was in the mind of the discriminator. Um, so by preventing them from, to, from getting to that next level to discovery, you're really disabling them from making their claim and the claim may not be plausible based on what is in the complaint. Under the Iqbal standard, individuals have fared worse than corporations or the government, and that arguably is in line with what others have said is a trend of the Roberts Court to be pro-corporate or pro-business. And as I mentioned earlier, this idea of relying on judicial experience and common sense 
that provides an avenue for bias, whether conscious or subconscious, to color judges' claims of whether plaintiffs, sorry, judges' analysis of whether plaintiffs' claims are plausible. So one study showed that for black plaintiffs claiming race discrimination, the dismissal rate increased from 20% pre-Twombly to 54.6 after Iqbal, and white judges were two times as likely to dismiss these claims as black judges. So by having this more subjective standard, you're really allowing the judges to have much greater discretion about whether someone can even proceed, not to whether they'll win, but just to proceed to discovery. Some have argued that the Twombly standard was never meant to be interpreted in this way, so one interesting point is that Justice Souter, who wrote the opinion in Twombly, actually dissented in Iqbal. Others, like Justice Stevens and Justice Ginsburg, have pushed back on the imposition of a heightened pleading standard altogether, saying that the idea behind the federal rules was never to keep litigants out of court, but rather to keep them in. I'll just end by saying that you know, ultimately, and part of the reason why I chose to highlight this case, even though it hasn't received as much attention, is that decisions like Iqbal are extremely important and impactful because the rights in the Constitution have little meaning if litigants lack access to the courts to vindicate them. Wow. So thank you, Lauren. I wonder how many of us remember that what, one of the things that made us a different nation from England is that we have a constitutional right to go to court. Not so in England. It was very, very difficult for people to get access to court, and it's written into our constitution that you have a constitutional right to go to court. So when you think of that in the context of this decision, um, I think it's, it's pretty stunning. I have to say, Lauren, I didn't know those stats, uh, but it tells you what happens. If you think of the question I asked to Linda, how many cases have sort of followed uh, Parents United, and you can see immediately the impact that that has had. You know, um, it is not true to say that judges would like to have fewer cases. Actually, we do would like to have fewer cases. <laughs> <laughs> and I think um, I can't but help take a moment now to say something that I say at almost every gathering that I have, uh, which is while we focus appropriately on the federal courts and of course on the United States Supreme Court, so many cases are decided in our state courts which are just overwhelmed by the number of cases. And although we don't necessarily have to follow the United States Supreme Court on a decision like this, it has enormous influence in how we decide our cases, whether do we decide to admit or, or, uh, or to dismiss a case. And so um, that, that extraordinary authority ripples very quickly um, across the country. Um, Michael or Linda, comments? Yeah, Linda. Yeah, uh, ju just one comment. Of course, the <coughs> Iqbal case, unlike parents involved, is not a constitutional decision. It's an interpretation of the federal rules, and it's within the power of Congress to change that. And there have been efforts uh, to pass legislation that would reverse Iqbal and return to the more liberal uh, pleading standard, and those have failed, and I don't think the general public, I mean, how many people in this room ever heard of this case before it came here? This yeah, is a right. very <laughs> educated audience, and uh, so, I, would, um, I would have put up my hand whether or not I'd heard of the case. <laughs> people really did get energized and made it some kind of issue, um, we don't have to live with this. Yeah. So I want to follow up on that. It is interesting. We, we sort of assume that the court's going to divide five to four on these big constitutional issues that capture the headlines in the newspaper. So we're not surprised when the court divides, divides five to four on affirmative action cases, abortion cases, death penalty cases. But there are actually a whole series of cases involving access to justice, which involve statutory interpretation issues, interpreting the federal rules. And the court tends to divide five to four on those as well, and they tend to be consistent five to four divisions. It's not a random five to four. There tend to be four conservatives, four liberals, and everything depends on where Justice Kennedy comes out with <laughs> unusual exceptions like the health care case. And I, I think what this tells you is there's a lot of room in law 
for the values of the judges to influence their interpretations. It's not to say that legal interpretation is nothing but politics, but it's to say that it has a lot to do with how these things are interpreted. And there are studies showing, and this is following up on what Lauren said, that one of the consistent takeaway lines from the Roberts Court, you can't, you can't characterize it constitutionally because Justice Kennedy goes back and forth. He's a liberal on gay rights issues. He's sometimes a liberal on issues involving the death penalty, school prayer, but he's conservative on campaign finance and race issues. But on issues involving access to justice and specifically on the issues where the Chamber of Commerce has expressed an interest, this is the most pro-Chamber of Commerce court in, in history. And there's a study by Judge Posner and a couple of academics showing that the five conservative justices are five out of the top 10 most pro-Chamber of Commerce justices in history, and Roberts and Alito are one and two. These don't get a lot of attention, but these are really important issues. The court's decimated access to class actions. It's cut back on access to conventional civil litigation. It's, a, it's contracted antitrust liability. These are a really big deal, and they just don't get the same sort of headlines, and the outcomes tend to be along the same kind of political lines that you would find in constitutional cases. <laughs> So one reason why they may not be getting the same attention, Michael, is because Linda Greenhouse isn't writing regularly for the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> if they got another Radcliffe graduate doing that, that would be great, <laughs> although I love her successes. Um, Lauren, I've had wonderful questions from the audience, but this one is, have, has come up sufficiently early for me to be able to ask you while you're here, which is, I th is given the sort of tougher standards for bringing the case, Will that have any impact on the people who are opposed to the Affordable Care Act and have brought cases challenging it? Is it going to mean that they too are going to be cut out of being able to bring their cases? So, I mean, I, I suppose that's asking about the standing question in the case before the court. I mean, I, didn't, I actually didn't list standing um, on my list of uh, areas because I think the Roberts Court has had a more of a mixed record on standing. Um, in some cases, they've, you know, they have restricted standing, like in the context of taxpayer standing and the Establishment Clause, but in other contexts, the court has found standing. I think the more cynical might say that the court finds standing when it wants to get to the merits of the case and it doesn't find standing when it doesn't want to, or when at least when, you know, five members of the court don't want to. Um, so and I'm, not, I'm not much to, I'm not one to predict or forecast, so I don't really know what will happen, but I, su I suspect that that cynical view might have one response to, to what happens in the King v. Verlaw case. Great. Linda. Uh, yeah, I mean, just to pick up on that, so a couple of the really hot button issues before the court recently have plaintiffs whose standing by conventional conservative metrics um, is very sketchy, to say the least. I mean, for instance, in the Fisher against the University of Texas case, uh, Ms. Fisher had, by the time the case came up, uh, already graduated from another university. So there was no remedy uh, that a court could award her. The, the, the case failed the, what's called the redressability prong of, of standing. Uh, and that was at issue, but the court just proceeded because, as Lawrence said, they wanted to at least try to reach the merits. Uh, there's been challenges to the standing of the current uh, like really sketchy plaintiffs in the current Affordable Care Act case, uh, the case being totally phony from the get-go, but also <laughs> phony in uh, <laughs> recruiting these plaintiffs who really didn't understand anything about the case, it turns out, and actually uh, failed the, the basic prong of the standing doctrine, which is injury, injury in fact, because the fact of the matter is nobody's injured by the existence of the Affordable Care Act. They have an ideological injury because they don't like the law but they cannot actually prove a financial injury, uh, but yet uh, the court, let's assume, is gonna proceed to the merits one way or the other. So that leads to a couple of questions that I've had, <clears throat> and I'm gonna try and combine them, which has to do with ju judicial activism, sort of reaching out whatever it is. So one way of saying this, is there a way to differentiate the Roberts Court's, quote, judicial activism from the earlier criticism of liberal judges, especially in the Warren Court, or is, is this only a question of ox scoring, or is there something else at work? And another uh, question saying the Warren Court was widely seen as activist from a position on the left, 
uh, on the basis of the principles of equality and liberty, um, this panel has criticized the activism of the Roberts Court. What principle defense of its activism would be made by conservative supporters of the Roberts Court? Now, unfortunately, I should tell you that Professor Manning, uh, a situation arose uh, very early this week that, that he had to leave for personal reasons, but Sir Linda, Lauren, Mike, put on your conservative hats, which you do when you teach your law students, and what's the best articulation for what the Roberts Court is doing? What the Roberts Court is doing? Well, I th I'm not to channel John Manning, but but uh, you know, I think from the conservative perspective, uh, the word that they use now is judicial engagement, that judges should be engaged, uh, should not step back from the fray, should not use barriers to you know, standing and so on, uh, to bring the court back, bring constitutional doctrine and doctrines of statutory interpretation back to uh, where they should always have been. So in, for instance, the type of cases that Lauren was talking about, there's been a great concern on the side of business that a lot of, uh, quote, frivolous lawsuits are making their way into court, and what's, and even though many of them have um, gotten dismissed ultimately, that's only after the defendant corporation has had to spend tons of time and money in discovery and all the pretrial stuff, and so if the barriers to entry are higher, and uh, these cases are, are uh, gotten rid of at the entry point. It just saves everybody a lot of time and trouble. I mean, that's certainly one, one argument. On the, on the constitutional side, uh, so Justice Kennedy would say, I think, and just is, as people know, Justice Kennedy's byword is, is dignity, and he views it as really um, an affront to human dignity to be classified by one's government on the basis of one's race. And, uh, you know, those of us who have doubts about that kind of jurisprudence would say uh, that's true as far as it goes, but it doesn't go far enough because it doesn't put it in the context of what's the purpose for the classification, what's the remedial purpose, or what's the even larger dignitary purpose, but I think uh, he feels that very strongly, and people, like-minded people feel that very strongly, that is simply um, uh, inappropriate and, and even uh, dangerous for the government to be in that business. So I maybe haven't done a very good job of channeling conservatives, but I think that's, <laughs> I think that's what as good as always, <laughs> Dolan. And I think that it's interesting that the court seems so worried about lower courts being flooded with frivolous claims and sort of practical aspect of litigation. And as an aside, one fact that I didn't mention is that there's a study showing that the heightened pleading standard that comes out of Iqbal hasn't actually resulted in higher quality claims based on the ultimate outcome. But I think the court generally seems, and you see this interplay a lot between the majority and the dissent, not very concerned with the practical effects of restricting rights. So whether it's in cases involving voter identification laws, abortion, you often see the dissent sort of saying, hey, but look at how this actually affects people in their day-to-day -day lives, and look how this affects poor people, look how this affects marginalized people, and the court seems generally unconcerned about that. So I guess if, you, you know, if you're operating in a vacuum, perhaps this seems like a purist interpretation, but if you actually <laughs> think about how these decisions are affecting people, you see a lot of opinions where the dissent just cannot believe that the majority is not taking that into account. Thank you. The <laughs> They have, I was going to let them just talk about the cases they wanted to talk about. It turns out a lot of you want to talk about another case, which you may think, not the one that hasn't been decided yet. We'll talk about that later. But Citizens United. <clears throat> I, I don't know whether they just avoided talking about it, but um, they didn't in any way. Um, just a ton of questions up here. Do you think any of the justices in the majority in Citizens United see it as now a disaster for American democracy? Or would the panel please comment on Citizens United? Or I want to hear about Citizens United. Or can you please, co and so on. OK, Michael, <laughs> please comment on Citizens United. So this actually ties in really well with the last question about activism. Um, the 
again, if you take as an example abortion regulation, when the court strikes down an abortion regulation, Justice Scalia or Thomas would say, the original understanding of the 14th Amendment has nothing to do with abortion. This should be left up to legislative regulation. So the question is, how do the five conservative justices justify striking down a ban on corporations uh, making independent uh, speech statements in elections? And, and this gets back to uh, Margie's last question, which is how would they defend themselves against the charges of activism? And the answer is they'll just say the text of the First Amendment tells you that speech is supposed to be protected and it doesn't say anything about who the speaker is. But this is another example. First of all, the fact that the First Amendment talks about freedom of speech doesn't say anything about spending money. And the people who wrote the First Amendment had an incredibly narrow understanding of what was protected. None of them would have dreamed that the idea of spending money on elections was protected speech. When Congress passed a Sedition Act in the first decade of the country's history, which put people in jail basically for criticizing John Adams a little bit too harshly as president, not a single federal judge in the country thought that law was unconstitutional because they had such a narrow view of the First Amendment. But the conservative justices won't talk about the original understanding of the First Amendment because it's so strongly against their position. They just say we don't even get to the original understanding because the First Amendment talks about speech and spending money is speech. I, I think it's a little bit outrageous because they're the <laughs> ones who say we ought to look at original understanding and there's really not a shred of evidence on their side on that issue. <laughs> Lauren, Linda? Well, your question about whether any of the current, the current majority, the Citizens United majority, uh, uh, is about to recalibrate its understanding, uh, they, they had that chance um, quite soon after the decision. A case came up from Montana where the Montana Supreme Court, in kind of defiance of Citizens United, had upheld uh, state corporate campaign spending limits uh, under the state constitution. And Montana had a very interesting history where corporations had basically bought US senators back in the day when senators were appointed by state legislatures. And so uh, the Montana Supreme Court said, you know, we're acting out of our own special history and we have these laws and, and we think we can make the case that the notion of corruption which is at the heart of Citizens United, a very narrow view of quid pro quo, basically bribery, corruption, that we understand corruption more deeply and this is what we think. And um, the court overturned it, uh, even without an opinion, overturned the Montana Supreme Court and, um, and said that state law was unconstitutional. So that was a chance to express a little bit of buyer's remorse and I don't see that um, anything has, uh, you know, come their way since that's gonna, if anything, they're, they're drilling down because last term in the uh, case called McCutcheon that the Chief Justice wrote, uh, the majority opinion, um, erased the limits on aggregate individual uh, political contributions. Uh, so it seems that every time they get a new chance where they might pull back a little, instead they go further. And, and corporations don't only have free speech rights, but they now have religious beliefs too, so they're becoming more and more like people, you know, the longer the court is. <clears throat> okay, I think that took care of <laughs> <laughs> Citizens United. I just, th this is really not on point, except it is on point. Quite often when I've had a debate with Justice Scalia on this point, he always says, I'd like to see the New York Times, knowing very well that I was married to somebody who worked for the New York Times for 50 years, I'd like to see the New York Times uh, say that they didn't have, you know, the free speech right to, you know, charge money for their editorials, is essentially his position. And my view was, but there's a protection of the press as well. So it's, it's never been a very engaged discussion, I have to say. <laughs> I, I do want to say one th additional thing, which is that almost everybody who thinks about Citizens United thinks about it in the context of the, t the executive branch and especially congressional races uh, or legislative races in the states. But there are many states that have elected judges, many states, 37 states have elected judges, and Citizens United applies to those as well. 
and something really terrible is going on in our judicial system in the United States because it is now costing huge amounts of money in some of those races and some of the very best judges are simply not agreeing to become judges or stepping away from the court. Um, the Mon my Montana uh, colleagues uh, felt very, very strongly about that case and I think uh, Montana, um, there may have been an amicus brief filed by former Chief Justices of the Montana Supreme Court in that case, Linda, because they know very well what happens when you get to put, it's bad enough putting money into congressional and, and presidential or gubernatorial races, it has a really powerful negative impact when you put it into judicial races as well. Um, so that's certainly something to keep in mind. <laughs> Perhaps um, as a final question before we turn uh, to Michael, um, there's a movement underway now, a kind of, let's see if we can persuade them to have new justices uh, who are appointed to the court to agree that they will step aside after a particular period of time. <clears throat> In other words, it goes to the length of tenure. Um, federal judges, as you know, serve for life at the time of the Constitution was written, you sort of, the approximate lifespan was 50. Um, so many of us are very happy that there have been medical progress since that time. Um, but it has meant that our justices are um, serving for longer and longer and longer periods of time. That is true, by the way, for the entire federal system, not just for the, the nine justices on the United States Supreme Court, but Congress has created a mechanism which makes it possible for federal judges on the circuit courts and the district courts to take what's called senior status. It's a little bit about what we do at universities now after they've put an end to um, 70 as a mandatory age retirement where you can remain a full-time act acting judge or part-time but you automatically get another judicial position in your court. That, of course, we can't do in the United States Supreme Court because we have the nine justices. So any views from any of you about whether that's a good or bad idea and what's the likelihood of it succeeding? Uh, and uh, Michael, you need not answer because your justice is sitting right here, or maybe you have a very <laughs> strong view <laughs> that you should answer. I, I had a couple of students who wrote a law review note years ago, and their proposal was uh, limited to the Supreme Court, but it would be 18 year staggered terms, and I thought it was a brilliant proposal. I don't think it has any practical chance of ever being adopted, but it was a brilliant proposal because it solves all the problems that exist with the current system. So there's a problem with strategic appointments. Presidents will appoint people younger and younger because they understand it's really important to have a particular view represented for as long as you can. There's strategic retirements. Justices will leave the court when there's a president sitting who they believe roughly represents the views that they want written into law. There's the problem of fortuity. William Howard Taft had five or six appointments in one four-year period. Jimmy Carter had none during his four-year four uh, term in office. And it's a mandatory retirement, which we have in most areas of life, and seems like it would probably be a pretty good idea in that context Not in well. academia, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think I can speak for Michael. You would support mandatory retirement, wouldn't you, Michael, for, would. for professors? I thought so. Uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think the 18-year the term, I think I, I read that student note, uh, is worth discussing for the reasons that Michael said. Um, the notion that, you know, Supreme Court nominees should voluntarily pledge that they would do it just strikes me as kind of nutty. But... Um, uh, it's, it's interesting that as democracy or what passes for democracy is kind of spread around the world and different countries have adopted aspects of our system, including uh, constitutional courts, not a single country has adopted life tenure. They've either had uh, age limits or uh, term limits of the 50 states. Only Rhode Island has life tenure for its judges, every other state has either term limit or age limit. So, you know, these systems are voting with their feet that there's something um, a little problematic about it. And it certainly does uh, elevate the, the kind of drama around any Supreme Court vacancy 
uh, because you're you're looking out at such a long timeline. Um, and as as Michael said, uh, justices are getting appointed at younger and younger ages. John Roberts was at 50 was the youngest chief justice to be appointed since John Marshall. So you know there's there's stuff to discuss about this. It's a it's it's a worthwhile conversation, but it's a very long-term one, and extracting promises from nominees is not the answer, I'm pretty sure of that. I would, just, I would just add that I don't know if implementing these types of proposals would help, but I think there's a real need, and perhaps having more frequent turnover would help with this, having a diversity of experience, not just we talk a lot about, or some talk a lot about diversity of race or gender in terms of who's on the court, but also diversity of experience and having relatively recent experience with how cases are litigated in practice, particularly in different parts of the country. I live in a state where people are routinely unrepresented by counsel. The cases are resolved without a defendant even speaking to a lawyer. Um, and I think having people who have prosecutorial experience or public defender experience and actually knowing how these things work on the ground, practice observing interactions between citizens and police would really help with you know, helping the court grapple with these issues as they try to decide how to deal with it at this level. It would, it, would be help, it would help to understand how things operate on the ground. And I would add just one last thing. I think I'm correct, and um, maybe I'm not, but I think this is the first court ever where there's been nobody with any state experience. And I don't mean but just state judicial, but Justice Sood, of course, had been a state court judge, and Chief Justice Wallen had been a governor. And I mean, be, I mean people who've had state experience, I think, is also important that we're, we're becoming an increasingly federalized uh, court and Michael, I don't know if it was you or John who told me that this year the court has taken a very few number of cases from state courts and uh, that's where most of the justice gets done. I, for one, have a proposal that if we have a limited tenure, either by age limitation um, or by um, um, numbers of years served, that it not be implemented until after the last sitting judge has it no longer applied to them because I think it's very problematic when you try to do it with a sitting court. And in any event, I would like to thank John Adams in the Massachusetts Constitution <laughs> for telling us that we had lifetime tenure because if we didn't, we wouldn't have this extraordinarily brilliant, wonderful, amazing woman that we have to celebrate here today. <laughs> so, if you are a lawyer, especially one who's just beginning their career, what is the very, very very best job in the world that you could possibly have. It is no doubt to be a law clerk for Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> and Michael Klarman is going to give us a little perspective of what it is like to have that beautiful position. Michael. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, when President Clinton nominated Ruth Bader Ginsburg to the Supreme Court in 1993, he said, quote, many admirers of her work say that she is to the women's movement what former Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall was to the movement for the rights of African Americans. Clinton, who was a graduate of a law school other than Harvard that shall not be named, <laughs> explained that he could think of no greater compliment to bestow on an American lawyer. Indeed, Justice Ginsburg is one of the few justices in American history who would be a deservedly famous American had she never served on the United States Supreme Court. So I'm going to tell you a few stories about Justice Ginsburg, about her biography, and her role as a trailblazing litigator for social reform. Uh, as Margie said, I had the good fortune to clerk for her 30 years ago, so I know some of these stories as a result of having uh, written some about her in the past. Ginsburg's personal story illustrates what the professional world was like for women half a century ago, how much it's changed since then, and how the efforts of a talented and hardworking lawyer can contribute to progressive social reform. When Ginsburg entered Harvard Law School in 1956, she was one of only nine women in a class of over 500. Harvard Law School had not admitted women at all until 1950. 
At the time that Ginsburg was matriculated at HLS, women were not permitted to live in law school dormitories. They were denied access to dining tables at the faculty club, and the annual law review banquet encouraged members to bring with them their fathers, but not their mothers or their wives. <laughs> Early in the school year, the law school's dean invited the nine women in the class to his house for dinner, and during the course of the evening's conversation, he asked them why they wanted to attend Harvard Law School, taking up a space that a man presumably could put to better use. Ginsburg reports being unprepared for the question. Now, as you may know, her spouse, Marty Ginsburg, was a year ahead of her at Harvard Law School. And as she later recounts her rejoinder to the dean, quote, all I could think to say was that my husband was in the second year class and it was important for a wife to understand her husband's work. <laughs> Few people at that point could have confidently predicted there would ever be a woman on the United States Supreme Court and indeed there was not for another 25 years. Ginsburg tra transferred to Columbia Law School after two years at Harvard when Marty graduated and took a job with a New York law firm. They were raising a young daughter at the time. Ginsburg graduated in 1959. She was tied for first in her class at Columbia, and she had been on the law review both at Columbia and at Harvard. Yet her professors had trouble finding her a federal court clerkship, even though she was eminently qualified for it. No federal judge in the New York City area would hire a young mother as a law clerk. Finally, one of her professors, Gerald Gunther, prevailed upon a federal district court judge, Edmund Palmieri, to hire Ginsburg by offering a personal guarantee that if she did not work out, he would find a male replacement. She worked out so well that in the future, Palmieri could not get enough female clerks. As most of you know, Justice Ginsburg was the leading women's rights lawyer in the United States in the 1970s. She argued six landmark cases in the United States Supreme Court, winning five of them. Now, one fairly unique obstacle confronted by lawyers for social reform is even having their arguments taken seriously. In 1938, Charles Hamilton Houston, one of the leading black civil rights litigators in the country and a graduate of Harvard Law School, literally had one of the justices turn his back on him during oral argument in a landmark race discrimination case in order to indicate his profound disrespect for a black man. Forty years later, oral advocate Ruth Bader Ginsburg had to confront condescending humor from the bench as she challenged the exclusion of women from juries in the state of Missouri. After Ginsburg had concluded her oral argument in the case, one of the justices leaned over from the bench to ask one final question. You won't settle for putting Susan B. Anthony on the dollar, then I take it. In another landmark case, one of the justices privately criticized Ginsburg's brief as emotional, invoking one of the traditional gendered put-downs of the era. Now, in addition to the challenge of being taken seriously, one of the principal difficulties that social reform litigators face is convincing justices of the unfairness of a system under which they themselves had benefited and which had become grounded in an ideology so per pervasive that they have trouble even noticing that its assumptions are controversial. Ginsburg confronted exactly that problem, trying to convince elderly male justices in the 1970s of the insidious consequences of sex classifications. Virtually all sex classifications are, as Justice Ginsburg likes to say, a double-edged sword. Many such statutes tangibly disadvantage males, not females, though they intangibly harm women by perpetuating stereotypes of female dependency, passivity, and lack of business ability. Ginsburg needed to convince these justices, that women were harmed, for example, by statutes that required men but not women to pay alimony or that permitted women but not men the choice of whether to serve on a jury. In a telling conversation with Harvard Law School students early in 1973, one of the male justices, and there were only male justices in 1973, expressed bewilderment as to why women wanted an equal rights amendment. In his view, quote, the female of the species has the best of both worlds. She can attack laws that unreasonably discriminate against her while preserving those that favor her. Ginsburg reported being depressed when she heard the account of that speech. A lengthy exchange between Ginsburg and two of the justices at oral argument in the case of Califano versus Goldfarb in 1976 
reveals how difficult it was to convince elderly male justices that all sex classifications adversely affected women because of this double-edged nature. The Social Security provision that was at issue in Goldfarb automatically provided survivor's benefits for the widows of covered male employees, but required that the widowers of covered female employees demonstrate actual economic dependency on their spouses. To Ginsburg, such a provision had three different flaws. First of all, it discriminated against female wage earners. Second, it discriminated against the male beneficiaries. And third, it perpetuated the invidious sex stereotype that males were primarily breadwinners and women were predominantly homemakers. Some of the justices had difficulty seeing these points. The first question that was directed to Ginsburg from the bench was whether the provision at issue discriminated against males or females, whether it could not be cast in either way, and why she had chosen to treat it as an anti-female discrimination. If the sexes were switched and only female beneficiaries were re required to establish actual financial dependency, one justice wondered, would that make a constitutional difference? Ginsburg's response was that, quote, the line drawn here like virtually every gender discrimination is a two-edged sword. Her interlocutor persisted. Some recent court decisions had focused on the history of discrimination against women, but he doubted that any analogous history of discrimination against men existed. Ginsburg responded that, quote, most anti-female discrimination was dressed up as discrimination favoring the woman. The justice replied impatiently, I know that, I know that, but the courts, through the help of advocates such as you, have been able to see through that, haven't they? That comment elicited laughter in the courtroom. Ginsburg gamely reiterated that sex classifications almost inevitably harmed women. Persisting, this justice asked her to imagine an instance of discrimination against males. Would her constitutional argument be equally strong? Ginsburg replied that her argument would remain unchanged, quote, because I don't know of any purely anti-male discrimination. In the end, the women are the ones who end up hurting. A moment later, another of the justices took up the same line of questioning. Should discrimination against males be subjected to the same standard as discrimination against females, or to a different one. Ginsburg repeated her previous answer. Almost every discrimination that operates against males operates against females as well. Bewildered and apparently annoyed, the justice responded, is that a yes or a no answer? I just don't understand you. Are you trying to avoid the question? Ginsburg insisted she was trying to clarify, not evade. She was aware of no sex classifications that did not operate as a double-edged sword. The exchange went on to similar effect for a while longer. Then came the following question from the bench. But your answer always depends on their finding some discrimination against females. You seem to put that in every answer to this question. Yes. Ginsburg, who must have been growing exasperated at this point, reiterated that, quote, I have not yet come across a statute that doesn't have that effect. Her questioner persisted. I'm not making this up. But if, that were, but if there were one, then would you say it would be treated under a different standard, I take it? Not wishing to alienate a potential ally or to make a concession that could harm her case, Ginsburg relented. If there were such a statute, she would reserve judgment on what the standard would be, but she repeated she had yet to come across such a statute. The justices who were asking these questions were very smart men. Their inability to comprehend what would strike most of us today as a fairly self-evident point speaks volumes about the challenges that social reform lawyers face in confronting the deeply rooted ideologies that make a system of oppression seem just and natural. Now, I've been talking about some of the challenges Ginsburg faced in court of convincing male justices of why sex classifications were harmful to women and as she would want me to add to men as well. But now I want to turn to another aspect of the job of social reform litigators, 
we tend to think of lawyers as people who go into court in pursuance of a legal claim. But in some ways, the most important job of the social reform litigator does not take place in the courtroom at all. The strategy of the Women's Rights Project, which Justice Ginsburg headed in the 1970s, included not just litigating cases, but also lobbying legislatures, training lawyers, and educating the general public about issues of sex discrimination. Ginsburg and the WRP offered assistance to ACLU affiliates throughout the country who were engaging in sex discrimination litigation. She advised them on priorities, and the WRP served as a clearinghouse for information, both about pending sex discrimination cases and about lawyers who were willing to help out with them. After her legal victories, Ginsburg would write memos to ACLU affiliates, instructing them on how to pursue follow-up litigation and legislative lobbying. Ginsburg devoted at least as much of her time to educating people about sex discrimination as she did litigating sex equality cases. When her female students at Rutgers Law School in the 1960s asked for a seminar on women in the law, Ginsburg spent a month in the library reading every court decision and law review article on the point that she could, on the subject she could find, which she reports was not a very taxing endeavor given how much, how little there was. Then she initiated such a course, and with two of her colleagues, she put together one of the nation's first case books on women and the law. She also wrote numerous law review articles on sex discrimination litigation, and she maintained a steady stream of correspondence with student law review editors, urging them to write about recent sex discrimination cases, educating them about the issues, and providing them with briefs and other materials to enhance their scholarship. And she traveled around the country, testifying before legislatures in support of the Equal Rights Amendment and speaking to ACLU affiliates and university audiences about issues of sex equality. She was an organizer, a mobilizer, a publicist, and an educator for the sex equality movement, much as Thurgood Marshall had been for the civil rights movement a generation earlier. While doing all these things, the social reform litigator also has to face the day-to-day -day challenges posed by an unjust status quo that they're litigating against. When arguing race discrimination cases in the Supreme Court in the 1930s and 1940s, Thurgood Marshall had a far hard time finding a restaurant to eat at in the thoroughly segregated District of Columbia. Ginsburg faced a similar sort of challenge as captured in a story she tells from this time period. Now remember, she's a tenured professor at Columbia Law School, she's head of the Women's Rights Project, she's a Supreme Court litigator and a frequent witness across the country on behalf of the ERA, but she's also receiving repeated phone calls at her office about her son James, who was then 10 years old and who was acting up at school in the way that 10-year-olds are wont to do. Finally, exasperated at the repeated phone calls, Ginsburg responded to one of them as follows. Quote, this child has two parents. I suggest from now on you alternate between them when you need to speak to someone about James. Ginsburg reports that even though James's behavior did not materially improve, the phone calls ceased because the school would not dream of bothering a busy male tax attorney <laughs> at his office during working hours. Social reform lawyers not only mobilize protests, they also provide valuable, I'm almost done, uh, valuable role models for members of traditionally subordinated groups. In 1960, of course, there had never been a woman on the United States Supreme Court. There had been only two or three federal female judges in the history of the country. In the late 1940s, President Harry Truman apparently briefly considered appointing a woman to the Supreme Court, Florence Allen, who was sitting on the Sixth Circuit, U.S. Court of Appeals. But when he consulted with the sitting justices, apparently that was a mistake, they <laughs> urged him against doing so. Apparently their concern was that her presence would inhibit them from taking, up their, taking off their ties and kicking up their feet at conference. In the mid-1960s, women were only about 1% of Supreme Court litigators, less than 2% of the nation law professors. Justice Ginsburg did not have a single female professor during her three years of law school. Not until 1970, if you can believe this, 
did the American Association of Law Schools amend its rules to bar sex discrimination at member institutions. And as of that year, women were still only about 10% of law school student bodies. Ginsburg appreciated the importance of female lawyers participating in sex equality cases. When she learned of the ACLU's involvement in what turned out to be the Supreme Court's landmark sex equality decision in 1971, she asked the organization's legal director whether a woman ought not to be involved as co-counsel in the case, and he agreed and invited her to join him. In WR, WRP litigation, Women's Rights Project litigation, as Ginsburg later noted, quote, particular attention was given to encouraging participation by women lawyers who seek assistance in maintaining their skills during periods when family responsibilities prevent them from working full time. Ginsburg's leadership of the WRP and her oral advocacy in the United States Supreme Court were inspirational to countless women. She herself never failed to highlight the contributions of past generations of feminists to her own work. In her brief in the court's landmark sex discrimination case, she placed the names of trailblazing feminists Dorothy Kenyon and Pauli Murray on the title page as a symbolic acknowledgement of the intellectual debt owed to them by contemporary feminists. And later, as a Supreme Court justice, she wrote numerous articles describing the contribution of pioneering feminist lawyers and judges, as well as the wives of Supreme Court justices. Many social reform activists do not live to say, see the day that their dreams are realized. Many of the first generation of abolitionists did not survive to see the enactment of the 13th Amendment ending slavery. And Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton did not leave, live to see the enactment of the 19th Amendment enfranchising women. Justice Ginsburg, of course, has not only lived to see the enormous changes in sex equality, but has helped to bring them about as a Supreme Court justice, as in her landmark decision 20 years ago, requiring the v v Virginia Military Institute to admit women. Justice Ginsburg, we're so happy you've afforded us this occasion today in celebrating your extraordinary contributions, both to sex equality and more generally to making ours a more just society. We are all in your debt. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Michael. And did I tell you that was the very best job to have in the world? Um, Liz, are you going to thank our panelists? Yeah, two things I need to say. You, you're going to thank them? Oh, I am. Oh, good. I, and you. <laughs> so I will just tie things up here quickly. I want to thank Margie and the panelists. Uh, you've taught us a great deal about the first decade of the Roberts Court. And I think you have equipped us. You have equipped us well for a future of court watching. Uh, I want to thank the audience for joining us this morning uh, in Cambridge and the many people who are online to honor Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Thank you.